It was December 18th, 2011, when 23-year-old Phoenix Colden drove away from her home and seemingly vanished into thin air. But what transpired is a story of two women, the grounded, dependable girl that her parents knew, and the real Phoenix with flaws, fears, and a history. This is the Case Remains Podcast, Episode 6, The Disappearance of Phoenix Colden. Phoenix was born in California on May 23rd, 1988, to Goldia and Lawrence Colden. Lawrence wasn't her biological father, but was in the picture pretty much from the start, and later formally adopted her. Phoenix was homeschooled and developed into a woman of many talents. She loved music and was a keen pianist, as well as being part of the handbell choir at her local church. Phoenix also had an athletic side, even becoming a regional fencing champion. She's described by her parents as being deeply religious, quiet and kind-hearted. On December 18th, 2011, Phoenix and Goldia left for church at around 11am. Goldia and Lawrence were dependent on Phoenix for transport at the time, as their car was in for repairs. After church, they stopped off at the shop before heading to their house in Spanish Lake, Missouri, arriving there at about 2pm. Phoenix didn't get out of her car when they got back, but according to her parents, that wasn't unusual. She would sometimes sit in the car to make phone calls. Reports on the exact time vary, but sometime between 2.20 and 3pm, Lawrence saw Phoenix back out of the driveway and drive away from their home. It was a little odd for Phoenix not to mention where she was going, but Goldia and Lawrence didn't think too much of it at first. They assumed she'd gone to a nearby convenience store and would be back a little later on. But when they hadn't heard from her the next day, alarm bells started ringing. Phoenix had never spent the night away from home before and wasn't one to even stay out late, always making it home before one in the morning. Goldia called the police, but was brushed off once they realised that Phoenix wasn't some runaway kid, but a 23-year-old woman. After all, adults aren't obliged to tell their parents their every move. The police ran Phoenix's plates through the system, but it came back with nothing. It was actually less than three hours after Phoenix was last seen that police discovered her 1998 Chevy Blazer, not that her parents were told about it. The car had been abandoned in a traffic lane in East St. Louis, about a 30-minute drive from the Colden home. Police were called to the scene and the car was towed away and taken to an impound lot. The car was registered in Goldia's name and it's not clear why they didn't just call Goldia to ask why her car had been left in the middle of the road. It wasn't until the 1st of January that police were able to make the link between the abandoned car and Phoenix Colden. It was subsequently tested for DNA, but none was found aside from Phoenix and her families. Let's take a moment to talk about the area that Phoenix's car was found in. With a high rate of crime and poverty, East St. Louis also boasts a homicide rate more than 21 times the USA's national rate, essentially making it the murder capital of America. But it's not just murder that East St. Louis is known for. It's also one of the top sex trafficking jurisdictions in the country. Running straight through the city is Interstate 70, well known in the area as a trafficking highway. Needless to say, it's not the kind of place you'd expect a homeschooled, God-fearing woman to end up alone. There has been some conflicting information as to how Phoenix's car was found. Initial reports said that the car was found with the driver's door open, the keys in the ignition and the car still running. Inside were Phoenix's glasses, purse, driver's license and shoes. Altogether, it paints a pretty sinister picture of a girl who was suddenly snatched out of her car unawares. But in the Oxygen documentary, The Disappearance of Phoenix Colden, reporter Shondrea Thomas and retired police officer Joe Delia spoke to the officer who'd processed Phoenix's car, and he told a different story entirely. He described the car as looking like any old regular abandoned car, like it had maybe run out of gas. The doors were closed, the engine switched off, and no sign of any kind of struggle or altercation. It was Goldia who had originally reported the details of the car to journalists back in 2011. But when the Collins were asked who had told them the details about the door being open and the car still being running, the Collins couldn't remember. 
The officer also said that there weren't any personal items in the car. In fact, he didn't even complete an inventory report because, according to him, there was nothing to report. Goldia, however, has numerous personal items of Phoenix's that were found inside the Chevy Blazer. It is possible that in saying there was nothing in the car, the officer simply meant that there were no items of significance, not that there weren't any items in it at all. But in an interview conducted near the time of the disappearance, Goldia mentioned finding a ripped up note with some pieces missing. At first it didn't look like Phoenix's handwriting, but after requesting a copy, Goldia compared it to writing in Phoenix's notebooks and determined that in fact it was hers. According to Goldia, the note was dated December 18th and read, We think you need to make up your mind before 2012 or else I will show you what I can do about your parents. Because the note was written in the same style as in Phoenix's notebooks, Goldia believes that she was jotting down something that someone had said to her. Also in the car, among odds and ends like pens and CDs, was an overdue notice for a mobile phone. Phoenix had a phone on the family plan, but the number on the bill was one that Goldia didn't recognise. It soon transpired that Phoenix had two phones, one that she had kept secret from her family. This was just one of several clues that would point to Phoenix leading something of a double life. Just nine days after Phoenix disappeared, another young black woman vanished under similar circumstances in Atlanta, about 500 miles away. 36-year-old Stacy English was last seen on Christmas Day of 2011, heading back home after a Christmas celebration at her grandma's. A couple of days later, the same day Stacy was reported missing, her car was discovered in southwest Atlanta, the engine still running. At first it seemed like both Stacy and Phoenix may have fallen foul of some serial abductor or worse. But in January, Stacy English's body was found. She was under a tree in a heavily wooded area, about a mile from where her car had been discovered. With no sign of injury and no drugs in her system, an autopsy determined that the most likely cause of death was cold exposure or hypothermia, complicating underlying neurological and psychiatric disorders. Stacy's death was officially ruled as accidental, but there are clearly some people who believe otherwise. In a statement released after the autopsy was concluded, Stacy's mother, Cindy Jameson, said, There is no doubt in my mind that there had to be some type of foul play involved. The way that she was found and where she was found, and that is what we were wanting to make sure that no one gets tired at this point. It's only beginning. There's a lot more work to do. There were things that Phoenix kept from her parents, like I'm sure most young adults do. But after delving into their daughter's personal life, the Coldens discovered that not only did Phoenix have a secret boyfriend, Mike B, but that she had even moved in with him when she was 19 years old, telling her parents that she lived with a female roommate. The Coldens are a deeply religious family, and it's easy to see why Phoenix may have chosen to keep this from them. According to Phoenix's friend, though, she had wanted to leave Mike B., and had been seeing another man, also called Mike, from around 2010 onwards. She wasn't sure if Phoenix was still dating him by the time she moved back in with her parents. Chondria Thomas and Joe Delia managed to track down an ex-girlfriend of the second Mike. The girlfriend had taken out a restraining order against him following a period of emotional and physical abuse. Phoenix had moved back in with her parents about six months prior to her disappearance, Lawrence and Goldia had been paying for her apartment and told Phoenix they could no longer afford it. And after all, their house was in the same area as her school, so it made sense for her to just live with them. A look into Phoenix's phone record suggests that Mike B was still a part of her life once she moved out, though. They had last spoken on the phone on December 17th, 2011, just one day before she disappeared. Their conversation lasted for 116 minutes. This wasn't unusual either, the pair had frequent phone contact. But when asked what their almost two-hour conversation was about, Mike B allegedly said he couldn't remember, according to Phoenix's parents. Mike B was also interviewed by the St. Louis County Police and was described as being cooperative and upfront throughout. He's never been named as a suspect in Phoenix's disappearance, and as far as police are concerned, he's completely in the clear. 
A secret boyfriend wasn't the only thing that Phoenix had been keeping to herself. Her parents were under the impression that she was enrolled in college that semester, but Phoenix had actually dropped out several months before. And it wasn't just Lawrence and Goldia she was lying to. She told her friends that she was still in college too. In 2012, it looked like the nightmare was finally over for the Coldens, when a man called in a tip claiming to know exactly where Phoenix was. The Coldens poured their life savings into investigators to look into the lead, which led them all the way to Texas. But it soon transpired that the man had made it all up. His idea of a funny joke. With all their money gone, the Coldens were forced to move out of the Spanish Lake house that they had shared with their daughter. The Coldens had already hired one private investigator, Steve Foster, very early on in the case. Steve revealed that Phoenix had been having heated arguments with her parents in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. It's fair to say that there were a lot of rules in the Colden household. Sit up straight, don't be loud, don't be vulgar, don't even cross your legs. Phoenix couldn't even be trusted to choose her own friends, instructed to find people that were on her level or higher and encouraged to bring potential friends around her parents so that they could assess their character. When interviewed in the Oxygen documentary, Steve said that he believed Phoenix had simply left voluntarily. During his investigation, Steve had discovered that she'd been taking her savings bonds from a safe in the house and cashing the balance amounting to around $2,500. Not only that, but Steve disclosed that Phoenix actually had two birth certificates, one in the name of Phoenix Colden and another in her birth name, Phoenix Reeves. Joe Delia got an associate to run the name through a national system, which uncovered one Phoenix Reeves who had only appeared on it in January of 2012, just one month after Phoenix vanished. Joe followed the lead to its registered address all the way in Anchorage, Alaska, but once there, he found a woman who'd lived there for years, with no recognition of the name Phoenix Reeves. A good friend of Phoenix's, Akira, who she had known since she was 17, confirmed that Phoenix had been having some trouble at home. She also said that Phoenix had been acting strangely in general ever since she moved back in with her parents. She was paranoid, convinced that someone was following her. A week before Phoenix disappeared, she and Akira had a falling out, with Phoenix accusing her of talking behind her back. The argument got so heated that Akira says Phoenix pulled a knife on her that she carried around with her in her car. She told Akira that she had to leave, had to get away, but she didn't say where she wanted to go. Phoenix had apparently shown signs of wanting to break free from her parents way before that December afternoon in 2011. According to her friend, one time she had even run away, But when Chandra and Joe asked Phoenix's parents about this, they denied that it had ever happened. But Golia had also noticed a shift in Phoenix's behaviour. They normally sat together at church, as you might expect them to do, but Golia said that Phoenix had started sitting further and further away from her in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. A tearful video that Phoenix had recorded of herself shed more light on her mental state at the time. In it, she talks about wanting to make a fresh start and wanting people to take her seriously. She says that she can't remember a time that she was genuinely happy. She's filming the video in her car and also makes a comment that she might as well be riding in the back of a police car. The video was filmed just one month before she vanished. In the years since her disappearance, two of Phoenix's friends claim to have seen her alive and well. In March 2014, One of Phoenix's friends from church, Kelly Fronhurt, says that she saw her on an airplane heading home from Las Vegas. She was with a small group of well-dressed women, all of a similar age to her, as well as a couple of slightly older men who she placed around their mid-thirties. Kelly called her name, to which the woman said, oh, do I look like someone, but then carried on down the aisle to her seat. Another friend, Jeffrey Hargrove, said that he had seen Phoenix twice that same summer in downtown St. Louis. Jeffrey was Facebook friends with Phoenix's uncle and recognised her from a photo he'd posted of her online. Jeffrey says that he asked the woman if she was his friend's niece, but that she just carried on walking. He said that he saw the same woman about one week later. 
Over the years, there have been numerous sightings of Phoenix, but like Kelly and Jeffrey's, none of them could be verified. Since December 18th, 2011, there has been no activity on Phoenix's social media or bank accounts, and no person of interest has ever been named in her disappearance. Goldia and Lawrence remain active in their search, certain that Phoenix is still out there somewhere. The Christmas tree they put up more than seven years ago still stands in their front room, the lights glowing like a beacon, calling their daughter home. Thank you for listening to episode six of the Kate's Remains podcast. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle Case Remains, or you can visit the website at www.caseremains.com, where you'll find write-ups on missing persons cases and unsolved mysteries. If you have a moment to spare, please do leave us an iTunes review as it helps others to find the show. Until next time, stay safe. <laughs>